Why did the advocates of globalization hold out such hope that it would bring the well-being of everybody, both in the advanced industrial countries and the developing countries, raise their living standards and make them better off? Well, actually, the ideas behind that go back several hundred years to Adam Smith, the great 18th century economist. He argued that by expanding the market, you could allow each to become more and more specialized. And as they became more specialized, they became more productive. You allowed each to produce the goods that it was relatively better at. And by each specializing in the areas that it was that it represented its comparative advantage, incomes again would go up. So they were living in a world where they believed that through trade, through the expansion of markets, one can increase the living standards of everybody. The question is, why has globalization not lived up to this potential? What was wrong with this economic theory? Well, there are actually several things that, that explain why it has not led to the promises that economists had long thought would almost inevitably follow. The first is that in order for developing countries to take advantage of the new opportunities, they had to be able to have the resources. They had to have access to markets, they, not, not just legal access, they not only have the right to export, they had to have harbors, they had to have goods to sell. Too often what happened was the goods from the advanced industrial countries would come into their countries, destroy their markets, people would lose their jobs, but no new jobs were created. So people moved from low productivity jobs to zero productivity unemployment. And this didn't help the country, and it certainly didn't help the people who lost their jobs. Economic theory is based on the hypothesis that somehow the market economy will ensure full employment. But we know in so many instances it hasn't worked out that way. Europe has been plagued with high levels of unemployment for now several decades. Economists debate about what the underlying cause is, but to the person who loses his job, he's not interested in these debates about among economists. What he knows is the symptom. He's lost his job, and he knows why he's lost his job, competition from abroad. If these are problems in advanced industrial countries, where there are so many resources, so much capacity to respond to the new opportunities, imagine what it's like in the less developed countries where there aren't resources to, to adapt to the changing circumstances. And developing countries are by definition economies where markets don't work well. So for them, the first problem is that because markets don't work well, because they don't have resources, they can't respond to the opportunities, and too often what happens is there's a growth in unemployment, not a growth in the economy. But that's only one of the reasons that globalization has not lived up to its potential. The second is that globalization, in the way that it's been managed, has too often been unfair. The agenda has been set by the rich and powerful countries, and more, more particularly, by the rich and powerful companies within those countries for their advantage and not for the interest of the global economy or certainly for the interest of the poor in the developing world. And we see that in every aspect of the international agreements and every aspect in which the international institutions that regulate the global economy work. For instance, in the last trade negotiations that ended in 1994, leading up to that, there was a, what was called a grand bargain. The United States and Europe, Europe wanted the ambit of trade negotiations to be expanded. Before, for the last 40 years, it had concentrated on manufacturing goods. Today, 
countries of the world that have the relative comparative advantage in manufacturing are increasingly in China. Ironically, it looks as if the trade negotiators have been negotiating for four decades, helping China get entry into the markets of the advanced industrial countries. Of course, that wasn't their intention. They were thinking about themselves, and at that time, at that time, manufacturing was their comparative advantage. But today, that's switching to China. Well, the bargain involved expanding the agenda into services and intellectual property, patents, copyrights. In return, the developing countries wanted something to be done about agriculture. 70, 75% of the people in the developing world depending directly or indirectly on agriculture. Obviously, agriculture was this, what they really cared about. And textiles. Textiles do not require high levels of skill. And yet, all the countries of the world had quotas that meant no matter how efficient they were in producing textiles, they couldn't get entry beyond a certain amount into, their country, into the countries of the banks, industrial countries. So that was the bargain. Services, intellectual property for the banks, industrial countries, agriculture, and textiles for the less developed countries. At the end, the advanced industrial countries did not keep their bargain. Yes, they got the expansion to services, not all services, only high-skilled services like financial services, not low-skilled services like maritime services, construction services, labor-intensive services. These were the comparative advantage of the least developed countries, the less developed countries, and the advanced industrial countries were not going to open up their markets to these goods. So what happened was that the advanced industrial countries got opening of services, they got intellectual property, but the other side of the bargain didn't happen. Textiles, they said, wait for 10 years. And after 10 years, they said, we're not ready yet. They had done nothing. They had promised to gradually adjust to help their textile producers be able to adjust to the change. In fact, they had done nothing. And in the area of agriculture, while there was a promise to reduce ex uh, subsidies uh, that make it so difficult for the developing countries to compete, the United States actually doubled its subsidies. And so clearly the less developed countries see the world as an unfair, the, level, the playing field is not level. The advanced industrial countries charge tariffs against the goods produced by the least, less developed countries that are four times higher than the tariffs they charge against other advanced industrial countries, the goods produced by those countries. So not only is the playing field less level, but it's becoming even less level. And the, advanced, and the developing countries said, we don't want to enter into another agreement of, of this kind. So the trade agreements and the other arrangements of the international area have not been fair to the developing countries. So unfair were they that in the last round, the poorest countries of the world actually wound up worse off. So that's the second reason why globalization has not lived up to its promise. There's a third reason. Trade globalization exposes countries to more risk. Volatile international prices, markets coming and going, shocks elsewhere in the world, a crisis in Asia causes problems in Latin America, a crisis in Russia causes problems in Brazil. The problem is that just when you need a stronger assistance from the government to respond to those crises, to respond to the increased volatility, Globalization has been weakening the ability of governments to respond. It's taken away their revenues. It's made it more difficult for them to, to, to cope with the problems that globalization presents. Developing countries rely, for instance, very heavily on tariffs. It's a major source of revenue. Banks, industrial countries can have uh, uh, sophisticated income taxes, they can have sophisticated VAT taxes, 
Uh, developing countries can't do that. They rely on tariffs. And that was historically true with the banks industrial countries 150 years ago when they were at a lower stage of development. So as trade agreements have forced tariffs to go down, revenues have, have been tightened. And that has meant there is less, less resources to cope with the risk which globalization presents. Augmenting this problem, making it worse, has been a particular ideology that globalization has confronted the developing countries. Uh, they've been told that in order to succeed, you have to have not just a market economy, but a particular version of the market economy. A particular version of the market economy that's more extreme than anywhere in the world. Over and over again, they are told to adopt not just the American style of capitalism without the social protections that are common in Europe, or even the social protections that are common in Japan, or other East Asian countries that have been successful, but a system which is Darwinian, uh, survival of the fittest, uh, let individuals fare for themselves. Uh, they've been told to privatize Social Security, get government out, privatize other industries, weaken uh, protections, job protections, uh, countries where individuals don't have savings, uh, don't have the large bank accounts on which they can call, fall back on. They're left to fend for themselves, and, and too often that means nothing but poverty. One of the reasons why poverty has not gone down, but actually in many countries gone up, uh, in the developing countries confronting globalization. So what these countries have been told is to, to adopt a, 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 a version of capitalism, market economy, that is more extreme than, than any of the advanced industrial countries have adopted. Making the problem still greater is that globalization itself often results in more inequality. We see around the world that the number of countries that, in which inequality is increasing is much larger than the number of countries in which inequality is decreasing. And actually, economic theory predicted that. It predicted that unskilled workers in the advanced industrial countries would face competition from unskilled workers, the abundant supply of unskilled workers in the less developed countries, and that competition inevitably would put downward pressure on unskilled workers. Meanwhile, in the developing countries, the poorest people, those in agriculture, face competition from the highly subsidized agricultural products of Europe and the United States. It's not like they're competing on a level playing field. They're competing where, uh, with Europe and the United States where over, in some cases, 50% or more of the income is derived from government subsidies. And so how can they compete? They don't have the resources to buy fertilizer. They don't have the resources to buy high quality seed. They don't have the resources to buy tractors. And confront, compounding all of these problems, they can't compete with the huge subsidies that the advanced industrial countries give their farmers. So the result of this is that there is growing inequality in many of the countries of the world, and that too is giving rise to dissatisfaction with globalization. Finally, globalization has given enormous power to corporate interests. I described before the, 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 the fact that globalization has been unfair, unfair to developing countries. But actually, the agenda of globalization has, to a very large extent, been set by large corporate interests. The intellectual property agenda, the protection that I talked about before, was really an agenda that was pushed by the America's pharmaceutical industry, to some extent by Europe's pharmaceutical industry and by the entertainment industry, by Hollywood that wanted uh, its movies to be protected, and its music to be protected around the world. American multinationals wanted to be able to invest abroad. European multinationals wanted to invest abroad. 
with the highest level of investor protections. That was their agenda. They weren't worried, of course, about the developing country, their worries about health, environment. Those weren't at the top of the agenda. And so the agenda that has been set, not on the basis of the principles that would normally be involved in debates and policy within Europe, within France, the UK, the United States, where we ask what are the impacts on each different group, who benefits, who loses, are the people who are losing particularly poor. That's not the kind of debate, of policy debate, that I was engaged in when, for instance, I was in the White House. These are intense debates, people disagree. We know that any policy has winners and losers, and we try to make sure that there is a balance and that particularly the very poor are not hurt. When the trade ministers go into the trade negotiations, the finance ministers go into the discussions of the IMF, it's not a balanced, it's not a balanced discussion. Environment isn't on the table, health isn't on the table. It's all, all set by these particular interests, these particular ministries and the people that they represent. So when they were talking about intellectual property, the concern about access to health was not foremost in their minds. Even the concerns of scientists about access to knowledge, the most important input into scientific research, that wasn't what they were concerned about. What the voice that they heard was the voice of the pharmaceutical industry and the entertainment industry. And so when the trade negotiators were sent from Washington or from the capitals of Europe, they weren't told, let's get a fair trade agreement. They were told, let's get agreement that is the best interest of America companies or the companies in Europe. Of course, make it seem like it's fair. That's the public relations department. Uh, do a lot of publicity, talk about fairness. But remember, it's in our interest that you're representing. Totally different from the way discussion, discourse goes on within our own country. And the result of this is exactly what you would expect. With the special interest, with the corporate interest dominating the agenda, the outcomes reflected their interest. I'll give you a few illustrations in just a minute. Let me begin and talk a little bit about the agenda on corporate, the role the corporations play in, in globalization. They have been at the center of the, most, uh, of the attack, of the critics of globalization, but in many ways they are the center of what successes there have been in globalization. The reason is that multinationals are, have the resources, the capacities, of moving everywhere around the world. A small business is, doesn't have the resources to do that. And so it's quite natural that the discussion of globalization has focused enormously on the role of multinationals, on the role of large corporations. Multinationals and large corporations have brought many of the benefits of globalization. I talked before about the successes of East Asia, of China. Many of the countries in East Asia, their success has been at least in part due to inviting in foreign corporations. Those corporations brought knowledge, they brought capital, they brought access to markets. In many cases, it wasn't the capital that was the most important. With a high savings rate in East Asia, savings rates in China have been over 40% and other East Asian countries over 30%. It wasn't capital that they needed. What they needed is technology on the one hand and access to international markets. And that's what foreign corporations brought. But they were able to make sure that they shaped the behavior of these corporations to promote the well-being of their country. They were make sure that the transfer of technology occurred. Example, for instance, was Malaysia, where it realized it needed foreign technology in order to develop its 
natural resources. Didn't have those, that technology 30 or 40 years ago. But it said, we want to be independent. We want you to come in and to teach us. We want you not just to produce, not only to produce our oil, but we want you to teach us so that we can produce our oil. And today, the Malaysian oil company is teaching others what it was taught. There's a very different mindset from this mindset where we are going to learn from the foreign corporations, we want to take advantage of their access to their international markets, and the mindset of those countries that let themselves be exploited by multinational corporations. And the problem is the relative size of the corporations creates an unbalanced playing field. Many of these corporations are much larger than the governments themselves that they're dealing with. Moreover, they're in a very good bargaining position. They can say, unless you give us tax concessions, unless you do what we want, unless you allow us to spoil the environment, we'll go elsewhere. Well, there, there are lots of other countries in the world. We don't need you, but you need us. And in that, in that environment of competition, too often the developing countries suffer. The politician wants jobs for his people. Unemployment in many of these countries is very high. The environmental problems are going to be there five or ten years down the line when his successor is in office. And so the focus is on creating jobs today, letting the future take care of itself. And the result too often is that the country gets a little bit of benefit today, but pays an even higher price in the future. There are many other reasons that uh, corporations have, have not played the positive role that they, they can, and they sometimes do. Uh, there is an important movement among, among corporations today called the Business Social Responsibility Movement. And I've seen it in practice where, where companies talk about the triple bottom line not only what their profits are, but also how well they're doing on the environment and in terms of broader social responsibility to their community, to their workers. And they try to assess how well they're doing. Unfortunately, many companies do not commit to business social responsibility. And many companies have found good public relations where they seem to be doing it and are not really doing it. The result of this is that in too many countries, the corporations see opportunity to take advantage of the countries, and it's just a matter of what you can get away with. Now, in the advanced industrial countries, we have strong laws, liability laws, that mean that if you harm a worker, you can be sued. You have strong government regulations today that say if you pollute, you can be sued or the government can stop what you're doing. Unfortunately, in, most, in many developing countries, there aren't these legal protections. And even if they were, poor individuals do not have the resources to sue the large corporations. An example of this was what happened in Bhopal, an American company chemical company did not take care of its plant appropriately, and there was a huge explosion. Tens of thousands of people were maimed, damaged, injured, lifelong consequences. And yet, they did not, the American company did not, did, had to pay very, very little. Uh, one of their officers said $500 a person was more than enough to compensate somebody for death. In a world in which life is, is in which there's such poverty, it's often easy for an international company to, to think of life as being cheap. 
what it would do, the way it would treat its workers abroad is completely different from the way it would treat its workers at home. It would view what it did at home as immoral. But when it goes abroad, it says the workers should be lucky to have a job. India tried to bring the officers of the company to accountability. It had to try to have a trial. But the officers were back in America. It demanded extradition. America refused. It would not allow them even to have a fair trial in the Indian courts. The result of this is that companies, their officers of the companies, often hide behind the corporate veil. And this is a, a general problem. In the America West, we often have, uh, we talk about movies, you, cowboy movies, you'll see where, the, where the, the bandit goes across the state boundary and the sheriff can't go across the state boundary. And as he goes across the state boundary, he finds a safe haven. The same thing is true with globalization. Too often, you go across the boundary and you're protected. The American, the American officers of, of, of the chemical company, they go back to America. They're in safe territory. Uh, they are protected. Uh, there's a way of shifting individual responsibility. Each individual says, it wasn't me, it was the company. But who makes decisions? Making all of this even worse is the foundations of corporations is this concept called limited liability. Without limited liability, you could not have had the growth of modern capitalism. Limited liability says that the most the investor can lose is what he's put in. That differs from partnerships where if I'm a partner and I do something wrong, People can go after my assets, my house, my other investments. With limited liability, the only thing they can get is the value of the company itself. The rest of my assets are fully protected. It's understandable why limited liability is an important social innovation, but it also has an enormous cost when it's abused. And too often, multinationals have abused it. What they do is they set up, for instance, a limited liability mining company in a country. They take out the resources, the leaving behind enormous environmental damage. When the country sues, they say, sorry, there's no more assets. All the assets have been transferred abroad, distributed to the shareholders, and there's nothing left to pay for the cost of environmental cleanup. The cost is left to the people of the country. So the wealth is transferred out of the country. The people in the country pay the consequences. It's a bad deal. In many of the cases, the country has only received minuscule royalties from the mining, one or two percent. I, let me explain that this is actually a problem not just in developing countries, but also in the developed countries. Jared Diamond has written a beautiful book called Collapse, where he describes how in one of his favorite stakes, Montana, the mining companies did exactly that. If this can go on in, in developed countries, you can imagine how bad it can be in developing countries. As another example, when I was in the Clinton administration, we tried to change the mining laws to make the mining companies pay fair market value for the natural resources that they were taking out. The old mining laws basically allowed the mining companies just to take a stake a claim, as they called it, to say, I've discovered gold, it's mine. And anything they discovered, any claim they, they made, they got the resource virtually for nothing. We said, that's not the way things should be run. These resources, the land, the public land, the value of the resources, should belong to the American people. We'll put it up to auction. Selling through auction has been very lucrative in the other areas. 
in telecommunications, the spectrum that is used for cell phones, radio, TV is being sold, generating billions and billions of dollars for the government. But the mining company said, no way. And they used their powerful influence in Congress to stop this very important initiative. So even at the end of the 20th century, even in advanced industrial countries like the United States, the resources are being transferred almost for nothing to the mining companies. And if this is what happens in a well-functioning democracy, you can imagine what happens in so many developing countries. So corporations have, have, have had an enormous sway in determining and shaping globalization. I mentioned before the area of intellectual property. And this provides a, an important area of, of seeing where, how it is played out. Intellectual property is important for providing incentives for creative people to, to engage in innovation, innovative activity. Writers wouldn't write if they didn't get some compensation. They need something to live on, even if they are motivated by a creative artistic urge. Similarly, for invention, it takes resources. No one is saying that there should not be intellectual property. That's a false argument, a straw man, that, that those who, who are advocating unbalanced intellectual property often put up. The issue isn't whether you should have intellectual property, it's the design of the intellectual property regime and understanding the costs and the benefits. What is the cost of intellectual property? Well, the costs are manifold. The first is that intellectual property creates a monopoly. Monopoly results in raising the price. Knowledge should be like a public good. The third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, talked about knowledge being like a candle. As you light as one candle likes another, it doesn't diminish from the light of the first candle. In that way, knowledge is different from ordinary commodities. If one person eats some food, another person can't eat that food. But if one person knows something, somebody else can also know it. So hoarding knowledge, making knowledge private, is inefficient. And so, in this case, monopoly results in it both too high prices of goods and too little usage of knowledge. But that's not the only problems that intellectual property, excessive intellectual property, can have. It can actually slow down the pace of innovation, sometimes through the force of monopoly, sometimes through the legal confusions to which it can give rise. Let me give you th three examples. One example has to do with the automobile. In the early days of the automobile, uh, an American inventor, Selden, got a patent for all four-wheel self-propelled vehicles. Of course, there were other people making, having the same idea around. There was Daimler in, in Germany, there were people in France, it wasn't like this was the first person to have the idea of a four-wheel self-propelled vehicle. What he wanted to do was to get this patent and create a cartel of all the producers, a monopoly of all the producers to raise the price. And had he succeeded, the development of the automobile would have been stifled. Fortunately, Henry Ford had a very different idea. His idea was for a low-priced car made available to masses of people. And he did research, innovation, to got the price of the car way down. Selden would have suppressed Ford's ability to bring the car out, and make it a mass, um, uh, 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 something that could be enjoyed by masses of people. And he challenged the patent. He had the resources to do it, and eventually he won. But had he lost, the development of the modern economy would have been set way back. As a second example, 
Microsoft. Microsoft has become a dominant firm in a dominant industry in the world economy today. It dominates in software operating systems and applications for Office in the PC market around the world. The result is higher prices than if there had been a competitive market. But the real worry is not only are prices higher, reflected in the huge profits that it's been made, but also innovation may have been suppressed. We can see what it did in the case of both the browser and media player. In the case of browser, the internet uh, browser, the innovator was Netscape. But with the control of its, of, of its operating system, it could provide its own Internet Explorer at a zero price, bundled in with the operating system. No one can compete with a zero price. Its intention was to drive out Netscape, which it largely did. But now others are seeing, if I come up with an innovation of enormous value, I too can be suppressed. I can't compete with Microsoft. And the recognition of what happened in the area of internet and so many other areas has resulted in a dampening of the innovation, of important innovations in this area. Antitrust authorities, competition authorities in Europe and the United States have all found Microsoft guilty of engaging in anti-competitive practices. But so strong is its monopoly as a result of its control of the operating system that they have not been able to break its monopoly power. A third example of a third reason where, where excessive unbalanced intellectual property can, can lead to a stifling innovation has to do with what is called patent thickets. And again, we can see an example of this in the early days, at the beginning of the last century, where there were two sets of patents on the airplane. One by the Wright brothers and the other by Curtis. The problem was with these conflicting and overlapping set of patents, no one knew who to pay in order to develop the airplane. And the development of the airplane was stifled as a result of this patent thicket. It wasn't until World War I when the United States government said, it's too important to be able to, it's too important, we need to develop an airplane in order to fight World War I, that they overrode the patents. They created a patent pool. They said, we're not going to allow you to continue to squabble while we suffer. We need the airplane. And they took these patents and they said, we'll decide how much each person is going to get, uh, each of the patent holders is going to get how much of the innovation, uh, how much of the contribution each uh, uh, makes. So even today we are facing this problem of patent thickets, particularly in the area of software. Everybody recognized, uh, got an enormous amount of attention when BlackBerry was almost put out of business, where someone had a patent that claimed that BlackBerry was infringing on. Some jurisdictions claim that that patent was not a valid patent. Most people think that, that that patent will not survive. But BlackBerry was not given the opportunity. It was said, the patent exists today. You either pay them or shut down. And they had to pay effectively blackmail of over $600 million. Again, that's going to stifle innovation. With thousands and thousands of patents every year, anybody writing a software program now fears that he will trespass on somebody's patent. And that is having a dampening effect in the software industry. And many people in the software industry say, we have to get rid of the whole system. We have to go to another kind of, of system. Now, the area in which uh, patents have been very strong, the most strong advocates of patents, has been in drugs. 
pharmaceuticals. And all of us have benefited from the enormous improvements in medicines that have occurred. From the point of view of the developing countries, they ask the following question, though. How much of what is being spent by the drug companies is actually going to the diseases that we face? More money is being spent on advertising, more money is spent on, on lifestyle drugs, like making sure that people have a good, good full set of hair at their head, uh, than is being spent in drugs for the diseases that affect developing countries. Very, very little is being, being spent. A model of, of what is called good behavior has been presented by Novartis, one of the European companies, which has, has worked with China and Singapore to bring out a new malaria drug, with some of the patents being held by people in Asia, and making this malaria drug available essentially at cost to developing countries. This, this is an example of what is called business or corporate social responsibility. But unfortunately, too many of the other drug companies have used the, the, the protection of intellectual property to raise drug prices, essentially to deny access to these life-saving drugs to the poorest people of the world. The balance has been that they put their profits over the right to life itself. The unbalanced nature of these intellectual property is reflected in how they've treated knowledge from the developing countries themselves. This is called traditional knowledge. There is a problem which I first encountered when I was in the upper high Andes uh, in Ecuador. I was in a village talking about how globalization was impacting them. And one of the striking things is that no matter where you go, you feel the impact of globalization. And the, the village mayor uh, talked to me about biopiracy. He talked to me about the fact that they have their indigenous medicines, plants that have been used for generations to cure diseases. And then an American firm came along and got a patent, and they now have to pay this American for the right to use what they had already always used. They viewed this, they say, biopiracy. Their, their ideas, their knowledge was being stolen, and they were now having to pay for it. There have been some dramatic examples of this. An American company was able to get a patent on basmati rice rice that was grown in India for hundreds of years. Another example was the use of turmeric, which is a, 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 a uh, plant for healing. Again, the role of turmeric in healing has been well known in South Asia for hundreds of years. And ironically, it was South Asian, South Asian doctors in the United States that got the patent on, on the use of, of turmeric for healing purposes. Another example is the use of the neem tree for a whole variety of purposes. Now, in many cases, these patents can be challenged, just like Ford challenged the, the Selden patent on the automobile. These can be challenged. But if you're a poor developing countries, country, you don't have the resources. India was able to challenge the basmati rice patent, and India won. But these other patents may require enormous amounts of, of legal expenses to, to prevail. And sadly, even when they've succeeded in prevailing in Europe, American patent authorities have maintained the patents. So even when Europe has been persuaded that this is not a legal patent, this is not a, this is, this is biopiracy, American patent authorities have continued to protect the corporate interest of those who have gotten the patent. 
An example of the, again, another example of the, of the asymmetry and the way globalization has proceeded it has to do with the incentives for preserving biodiversity, which is such an important source of new drugs. The advocates of strong intellectual property talk about the importance of incentives. But when it comes to the incentives of developing countries, they're not, they're not very interested. A very large fraction of, of patents involving new, uh, not only drugs, but also new plants, have, have as their origin uh, this biodiversity from the developing world. It's an enormous reservoir. And the world got together in the, in the beginning of the 90s and agreed on what was called a bio, biodiversity convention. Part of that biodiversity convention was an agreement that those in developing countries who've protected this biodiversity should be compensated when the fruits of that are used by those in the West for their drugs or plants or whatever patents they have. But under the influence of American corporations, the United States has refused to sign this biodiversity convention. Their view is, we want the patents for our companies. We don't want to have to pay the developing countries for the incentives for protecting their biodiversity. So it illustrates the unbalance, the role the corporations have in, not at, in, in, in determining the agenda, particularly in the strongest force in globalization, the United States. They aren't asking what is a fair system. They aren't asking what is an efficient system. They're only asking what is in the best interest of our corporations. If you were beginning from the perspective of what is good for the environment, if you're asking what is good for the global economy, what is fair to the developing countries that are providing enormous environmental services of value to the whole world, you would say, yes, we have to sign the Biodiversity Convention but the United States refuses. I teach at Columbia University, and a major research university uh, in America, research universities have played a very important role in the development of knowledge. Uh, and I think have given the United States an a important part of the explanation of America's lead in so many areas of, of innovation. But America's research universities are strong mainly because of government, government support for research. I emphasize this to emphasize the point that we have a complex innovation system. At the basis of that innovation system is basic research. Basic research, producing knowledge that's of benefit to everybody in the world, is supported by the government. On top of that basic research, there is an important role for corporations to bring the benefits of that basic research to the market. But we have to understand that that is only one part of the innovation system. The whole innovation system rests on the basic research that is provided, supported by the government. And too often, if we have an unbalanced intellectual property system, you can actually impede basic research in order to protect the interests of the corporations. One of the areas where I believe we've lost our way, gotten an unbalanced intellectual property regime, has to do with the patenting of genes. Genes are the, are the underlying code that tells the body what proteins to produce, it regulates our whole system. Uh, it, 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 it is the instructions of life itself. And one of the great achievements of science in the 20th century was understanding the genetic code and decoding the genetic code of, of, of the humans. This Human Genome Project was an enormous project. 
uh, involving researchers from all over the world, and it succeeded. But while they were working to decode it, there were some others in the private sector that were racing ahead to try to get decode one gene or the other. If they succeeded, they would have gotten the knowledge maybe a day, maybe a month, maybe two months ahead. But the consequences for the world would be very slight. Uh, the